G'day, Bomber fans. So I asked you guys last week to leave some draft and trade related questions down in the comments below, and I've done my best to answer all of them. Today, it's a little off-season Q&A, longer video, so we're going to just hop right in. Alrighty, Jaden kicks us off. I know it seems like the trade is dead now, but how aggressively would you tra uh, target Petrarca, and what would your godfather trade offer be to get it done? I've never liked the idea of big draft-killing trades. It's good to bring in stars, but you... You run the risk of ruining a draft hand or giving away too much, I guess, when you try and bring these players in. And that's what happened with Dylan Shield back in 2017, 2018, whenever it was. So if I had to offer up something, it would have to come with a player attached. Uh, the issue is uh, finding a player that both teams could agree on moving. Jake Stringer's being linked with a move away this summer. Melbourne do need options up forward. But even then, you'd probably still need to throw in a high draft pick at least. It would realistically get into the range of... Jake Stringer, pick 8, and then our, our next pick as well, which is, I think, 28. And, and even then, um, that probably isn't enough. It doesn't sound too bad, but maybe, if anything, if it favours uh, us over the Ds because I'm happy with it. So they would probably want more. It would be way too expensive to get P uh, Petrarca. I don't like the idea of trading away that much. A free agency is just easier. So I wouldn't be offering a Godfather deal, but if I had to, it would be a player attached and a high draft pick. Flag Dons 24, unfortunate name, by the way, but they ask if Harley Reid was to come to Essendon, what would the cost be? Uh, it would be more than Petrarca, and that is too much already. A good indicator here is what North tried to offer last year for pick one. I believe it was four first round draft picks in exchange for pick one and something else down the line. That was to get pick one to use on Reid, but West Coast turned that down. And now what the Eagles would say is that Reid has proven the hype is real with his performances and is worth more because of it. So it would be an unaffordable amount of draft capital. Even if you offered up Nick Martin, for example, and pick eight, West Coast would say, no way. There is no reason for them to try and trade Reid right now. He's making them relevant. People tuned into games just to see him play. I reckon it would be Nick Martin, pick eight, and a future first. And even then, that is still not even close to enough. Getting Reid would ensure that more than one draft hand is destroyed. It's just not worth it. The simple answer is too much. Hello, Trish. So what would stop other clubs from trying to weaken our draft hand by bidding on Isaac Kako before pick eight? And how likely is it that that will happen? Well, this is interesting and something that I think about quite a bit when it comes to academy players. So if a club is to bid on an academy player, it would mean that they have to be content with having that player on their list because if you bid too early and the club do not want to spend too much draft capital on the player, they don't have to. A club can elect to not match a bid if they want. So you always run the risk if you are bidding that you end up with the player um, on your list. So by that logic, list managers would only ever bid on players that they actually would want on their list. And I guess by that logic, the player they bid on is always worth around their value. I think bidding to make clubs act is only ever a handful or so selections higher than where the player actually deserves to go. Let's say a club takes Kako before pick eight, they would be missing out on players that are simply put more promising or better than him. Kako looks great, but he is a long way off what you would get for a guy at pick six or seven. If you're bidding on Kako, you're not doing it solely to make another club respond. You're doing it because you would want him on your list. Maybe this could happen later in the draft, but there is a big difference between a guy like Isaac Kako and Harvey Langford, for example. And you know what? If a club was to pass on Harvey Langford at seven to bid on Kako, I would rather Essendon then, or they take Kako and Essendon get Langford or Draper or O'Sullivan, whoever they, the other club would be passing on instead. But, but expect us to be choosing a player in the top 10 before Kako comes into the mix. I really don't think Kako's bid will come before it is deserved. Richard asks if we can trade Laverde for Hardwick. I'm guessing that's not Damien Hardwick and it's Blake Hardwick from Hawthorne. I doubt it. Uh, that would be a steal for us. Uh, Hardwick is a really handy player, but he would be happy at Hawthorne. That looks like a fun team to be at right now. We'd have to offer him obscene amounts of money to tempt him to come across. Uh, he, would, he would want to stay at Hawthorne for sure, but no, nah, it'd be good to have a guy like that on the list, but that's not going to happen. All right, some more trade period. What position would I highlight as an area Essendon should focus on during the upcoming trade period? Uh, right now, despite our forward line lacking the most. I actually think it's down back that probably requires the most attention right now for a quick fix. We've just lost Kelly and Heppel, Hind and Langanine have been delisted and then you've got Baldwin up in the air who's uh, been let go. So we have five defenders. We've lost five defenders and of course there is news that Jaden Laverde could be on the move. I think we need a mature defender or two through the doors just for depth alone. Uh, we can't go a whole year relying on Ridley and Reed. They're, they're just too injury prone. So I'd really like to see a mature defender or two, uh, either in the air or on ground level too, to be honest. Either way, just some coverage somewhere would be handy. I think that's the zone that most needs a quick trade period fix. And Jaden follows up with a similar question, but with a very different answer, I reckon. Uh, so the question is pretty much the same. What player or position should Essendon target in the upcoming draft, not trade period? Um, well, I like to look back on the last few drafts and see how much promise I see out of 
every zone. So Nate Caddy up forward is a tick for the future. Archie Roberts on ground level gives us a good starting point for that new generation of rebound defenders. Uh, we're putting lots of time into Vigo and the Ruck, uh, so really the areas I think we've missed the most in recent years. Small forward, but we're getting one for free in Kako. And honestly, star mid. I know we have drafted a lot through the doors, but it doesn't really look like it's paying off, and we can't just completely disregard improving the midfield uh, because we have depth there. Ideally, we offload Shield or Setterfield, gives a, give Hobbs or Sartas a go, uh, but also bring in some new blood uh, to potentially spice up the fight for spots. And this upcoming draft is really great for midfielders as well, which means you could find an absolute gem a lot later than you would usually have to. There will be some really promising kids that will slide to our pick eight. I wouldn't be against taking a midfielder with that pick. We really lack a star to get excited about. I know I just got asked the same question by Jaden, but I will answer Dylan's with very specific players. Uh, so as for midfielders, I think we will probably be choosing one with our first pick, uh, just because there's so many. So pick eight will likely turn into pick nine or 10 or 11 on the night, which gives us a look at guys like Sam Layla or Murphy Reed, uh, potentially a, sl a slider like Josh Smiley. There are about 10 or 11 midfielders that I can definitely say will go in the first round, and there'll be even more uh, in the later stages of the first round too that we don't know about. So we could have a few to choose from, uh, but there are also some good key forwards. Job Shanahan, Harry Armstrong, or maybe you want to pick them later in the draft. Uh, Jonty Fall, Jack Whitlock, and others will be available around the second round. There will also be some good running backs, Harrison Oliver or Lockie Jakes. Uh, the market for key backs isn't as great. you got some later in the draft, but nothing that will really be a big talking point early, I would say, unless Luke Trainer, uh, Trainer falls to our uh, pick eight, but that's really doubtful. I'll make plenty of draft videos later down the track, though, highlighting just about every player in the draft. Alrighty, I mentioned them both before. Uh, Armstrong or Big Job is the question. Uh, these are the two best key forwards in the draft. Really tough to split them. Uh, the club could potentially choose one of these two with our first selection. There's every chance we do. They are around that range. Uh, Job Shanahan is a key forward out of New South Wales. He recently played with our VFL team and was genuinely incredible. He kicked uh, bags of four, bags of five. He looks great. Looks ready made too. He, he's pretty strong. Great hands. What that means for his ceiling is interesting because Harry Armstrong probably hasn't really shown his full potential despite being the most consistent goal scorer in this draft. You can definitely see levels he can go to with a bit of beef on his bones and more consistency. Uh, he only really shot up into draft contention this year, so he's pretty new to this high level, whereas Shanahan has already played VFL uh, for me, it becomes the question of would you rather a player who you know will be at the, at the very least pretty good in Shanahan, he's shown that with VFL bags as a 17-year-old, or would you rather a player who arguably has the highest ceiling of the two in Armstrong? I'll talk about both these two a lot in the coming weeks. Alrighty, a Malcolm Roses question. I knew one of these was going to come. Um, I really like Roses. Every game he's played this year without being subbed on or off, he's kicked multiple goals. Uh, that's really good. He's had a bit of an iffy career overall, some incredible performances and some passenger-like ones. So we got to know what we're signing up for if we do target him. There's every chance the fan base questions the trade in hindsight in a few years because he's just not a proven forward. And we have already uh, got quite a few unproven smalls on our list. And that's the issue. Do you really want to add another one in, in this trade period while getting Kako in the draft? I think if we do get Roses, we have to get rid of Davey. That would, that would make me like the move a bit more. But if we sign up Davey and get another small forward plus Kako, I'd be pretty confused. I wouldn't mind Roses on our list, though. We have tried in the past. He's pretty talented and, and pretty exciting. Similar question here, I guess. Uh, can we still sign Matt Owies and what would we uh, what would he bring to the team? Uh, well, he would bring consistent goals. He kicked 33 goals from 23 games. He was only goalless three times, 15 assists as well. He's still out of contract. I don't really know why. I suspect he will get signed up. And those in the media are saying the same thing. It would be a wild list call to get rid of Owies, but uh, there isn't heaps to his game, I guess, but he, he kicks goals, and we don't really have many small forwards who do that. He kicked more goals than all of our forwards, Bar Stringer and Lakeford this year, so uh, can we still sign Owies? Probably not, it seems, um, unless we go really hard for him, but is he worth it? I don't know. Would he bring improvement to our list? He'd bring go goals, so yes. All right, so this was kind of why I wanted to make the video. Mac Andrew, now there was a bit of uh, Twitter news that went across uh, went around saying that we are uh, the club that offered him, uh, what, what was it, 10 million across eight years or something like that, some ridiculous figure. Now, he's very exciting, to be fair, and that kind of money is going to be uh, pretty more common in footy in the coming years, but this is going to unfold in a year from now if it does. We may have told his management that we could be prepared to offer big money when he's out of contract, but it doesn't mean we will. Uh, this was Tom Morris who came out and said that an unnamed Victorian club was thinking about this offer and narrowed it down to us and St Kilda because we have the funds. Uh, these kind of stories always float around, though, and never eventually in anything. It happens a lot. I'd like Mac Andrew on our team, but ideally we aren't paying that much money for him. He is out of contract next year. Jezelenko asks if there is any way we will improve our draft hand. Uh, well, it's a good draft, so we probably should. Uh, we might be uh, trading some guys away. Laverde, Stringer, 
Kepler, Hobbs, Sartas, they're all in the mix, and not all will be traded, probably one or two at most, uh, maybe none, but if we trade some guys away, it will boost our draft hand a bit. I wouldn't mind us eating into next year's draft to swap some picks around, trade future picks for uh, other teams' current picks. That is something that can happen on the night as well. We might keep a fairly lowish range of picks to match Kako and then actually try and move up uh, the order like we did on the night with Roberts last year or with Caddy uh, for players that we want and can afford with a change. There is a lot of work to do for Rosa and his team, but there's lots of ways to do it, which is promising. Some more specific players. Uh, what are thoughts on getting Riley Garcia, Tim Membry, or Jai Farah? Uh, I'll go in order. Uh, Garcia looks decent, but would he get game time in our midfield? And if we use him up forward, would he really be a fix or would he just be another fringe member like uh, the many we already have? I'm not sure. I like Garcia, but I don't know if he's the right fit, uh, fit at Essendon. Tim Membry has always been a pretty good footballer. If we lose Stringer, I'd be all for getting someone like Membry if he is cheap enough, just for a year or two while uh, Caddy and Jones continue to develop, because I do think we need a mature option in the forward line still. Jai Farah, I, I think there are probably better options out there. I like the thought of getting these unwanted guys who aren't being utilized though. Uh, there have been some pretty good delisted free agents in the last few years and some good cheap trades. Massimo is proof of that. Very similar question. Uh, thoughts on giving those B to C grade uh, players a go instead of the certified stars with plenty of players listed. Uh, yeah, I think it's good when it works. Not great when it doesn't. 2022, we got Setterfield and Wiedemann. Uh, that's proof of when it goes wrong. But even then, it wasn't really a massive risk. A few of these guys, you listed are good players. And then Hawthorne have, have uh, built a premiership charge off doing this. Uh, so Cleary could be a good backup for Laverde if he leaves. Uh, Lemons is handy. Lee Lear is probably too expensive, I reckon. He's pretty hyped. Isaac Cumming is already going elsewhere, it seems. Uh, Denver Granger Barras is made of tissue paper, but he is... Uh, he's got a lot of potential. I uh, like Bailey Laurie and, and Zane True is promising too. Plenty of these guys around, like we saw in the last question. Some, more, some others I want to throw in, and these are real basement options. Not guys that I would think would drastically improve our list, just depth, but uh, Reef McInnes uh, or Jack Carroll from Carlton. Heaps around. I might make a video about some bargain options, to be honest. Who are three realistic flankers, forwards or back, that we can target in the trade period? Well, Harry Perryman is probably the best flanker on the market, but we aren't in that race, it seems. That is a realistic option, though. He is available. He's a free agent. Uh, while on GWS, Connor Stone. Now, this is not a player to get excited about, but he is a high draft pick who hasn't put it all together. He's very fast, very strong. Uh, he's in the forward line. He can play midfield, but I see him more as that high half forward that impacts stoppages. That's a realistic option. Might even be delisted, to be honest. Caleb Daniel is another, I guess. Uh, I'm sure clubs could pry him away. away. He's too good to be used as a sub, which is what he's been for a lot of this year. He's an All-Australian halfback, if I'm not mistaken. At least he's, he was he was in the squad at some stage. Uh, that's three right there. There are guys like Houston who could who are on the market, but I don't think that's realistic, if I'm being honest. And finally, who would be the Backman draft picks that would be a candidate for pick eight? Uh, there aren't many, to be honest. Uh, Luke Trainer could slide, but he's probably going to go early. The defenders come later in the draft. Uh, Toby Travaglia is pretty great. He's a rebounding defender. I don't know if it would be the play to pick him up with our earliest selection. There will most likely be better options around. Uh, Bo Allen is another. Uh, he's kind of like Dan Curtin, a bit from last year's draft. Bigger body that can play anywhere he wants. Uh, WA born, great leader. He could be in line for pick eight. Uh, keep in mind, pick eight will turn into pick 10 or even pick 11 with matched bids and possible compensation. As far as defenders in this draft go, it's probably something we look at later in the draft. But that is that. Those were all your questions answered. Uh, cheers for coming in clutch with good questions yet again. It would make these videos pretty boring if they weren't, uh, but it was good fun for me. Uh, stay tuned to the channel for plenty of trade and draft related content. There's going to be a lot to talk about in the coming weeks. Uh, like, subscribe, and go Bombers.